you know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Well, welcome to the Chasing Giants podcast, episode 146 on December 3rd with Don Higgins, Terry Peer. Don, uh, this this podcast thing the last few weeks has absolutely blown up. I'm not sure if we just got into some different analytics or all of our buddies that listen to the show have started telling their friends, but let's just start with giving a big thank you to all the new listeners that have that have joined us. Yep, for sure. We appreciate every one of you. And yeah, T- Terry, I noticed on YouTube that our views just on YouTube only are more than double what they had been, you know, like a month ago. So uh, I don't know if people quit listening to to it on their phones or in their vehicles and started using or watching on YouTube, but whatever it is, uh, YouTube's exploded. I haven't looked at the other analytics, and so maybe you have. Yeah, it's 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 grown in every platform, not just in YouTube. And one of the things that we want your feedback on, this is just this is just giving feedback back to Don and I. We've started recording on Saturday night so that we can upload earlier in the day on Sunday. When we first started doing this podcast, our goal was to record it so it would be ready for the Monday morning commute. And I think a lot of people on Sunday afternoons like watching this. So by us doing it a day early, we can record or we can upload it and have it ready just after church. So if you like that better, leave a comment down below or let us know if you prefer it that way. We just we're trying to adapt and get better as we go. So any feedback is good feedback. That's right. We're just a couple of simple country boys. Uh with a little bit of technology in our hands and making the most of it. And if it wasn't for Terry, I'd be totally lost, but he keeps dragging me along. So if you're relying on me, if you're relying on me, we're, uh, we're in trouble. I'm glad you got people like, uh, Bruce and Steve on the whitetail Academy to help you on that. Cause that's out of my league with technology. So, uh, we got a lot to talk about this episode. It's December 3rd. And we're going to kick off the show uh, with some housekeeping things. And then after um, a message from our partners at Osseo Gear, we're going to circle back and talk about late season tactics and decisions. And I think, Don, we're in that pivotal moment where we're kind of transitioning from uh, the phases of the rut into late season. And there's going to be a lot of people in different scenarios. Uh, Their target buck may have got shot or they don't know where it's at. And they're trying to decide what to do with an empty tag. And then uh, there's somebody that might have their target buck still identified and know that he's around and needs help or advice and adapting to those. So we're going to use some examples of some bucks you've shot or decisions you've made in the past and talk about that here in a little bit. But with the housekeeping side, let's kick it off to start the show with an upcoming schedule you have with some um, seminars and events, and then that'll feed us into talking about you starting your consulting season in Indiana already. Yeah, Terry, I've got a lot of events coming up uh, uh, between now and uh, mid-February where I'm going to be appearing or speaking, and actually you're going to be at at least a couple of those too. Um, The first one is December 16th. Um, There's a benefit supper and a seminar in Vestiburg, Michigan. Um, the supper is by donation only. It's for an Amish school. You do not have to be Amish to come to this event. They'll welcome anybody. Um, if you, I'm just going to give phone numbers for each one of these events. I am not the one in charge of any of these. If you have any questions whatsoever, do not call or text me. <laughs> call these numbers that I'm, I'm giving you because, folks, I don't have the answer. And, uh, you just need to call these numbers. So for that December 16th event in Vestiburg, Michigan, the number is 
0518. Uh, January 27th and 28th, I'm taking part in a field day with uh, one of the real world distributors, Tag Out Technique. Um, they have a farm that I've worked with them on uh, numerous times over the past four or five years. Uh, this field day is going to be property tours. It's also going to include a lunch. The, this is a Friday and Saturday. Um, there's, there's basically two groups are going to go out each day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. You need to register ahead of time um, to, to get in on one of these. It's limited to 25 people per year. Um, per group. So there's a, a total of, of 100 people. Uh, there is a small cost with that. Um, it's in Plymouth, Indiana. The number for that is 574-248-0322. Uh, February 2nd, Terry and I are doing a live Chasing Giants podcast in, in Middlefield, Ohio, um, with our good friends Ray and Aiden Miller. Um, I'm not sure about the location in Middlefield, but uh, two phone numbers you can call to, to come and watch Terry and I and ask questions, put us on the spot. We don't even have time to prepare for your questions. Um, but the numbers you can call there are 440-321-5336 or 440-813-5455. Um, February 3rd, the very next day, I'm doing a seminar for JB's Feed and Supply in Millersburg, Ohio. Um, that's uh, at least an hour, maybe two hours from uh, Middlefield, where we're, we are the evening before. Um, the uh, To get information on that Millersburg, Ohio event on February 3rd, you need to call 330-231-6465. Then February 16th, I'm going to be doing a, a seminar at a dinner for Heartland Outdoors. They are a real world dealer in Falls City, Nebraska. Um, this event, it's $40 a person, but that includes your meal. Um, they've got a uh, gun raffle and just all kinds of things going on that evening. Uh, for more information on that Falls City, Nebraska event on February 16th, you can call 402. 883-7547. And then the, the last one on my calendar would be February 18th. That one will be in Salina, Kansas. Uh, that's the Whitetail Management Summit. There'll be, uh, it's on a Saturday. There's three different speakers that day. Uh, myself, Dr. Bronson Strickland from the Mississippi State Deer Lab and uh, Whitetail Consultant Wes Delks is gonna be there as well speaking um that day is uh well i include a barbecued lunch it's 65 dollars a person um they're going to offer discounts on uh, various products that day that uh, um philip seed farm sells real world products and i think they sell some feeders and um, hunting blinds i think 360 hunting blinds as well so uh if you're interested in attending that whitetail management summit in salina kansas on february 18th you can call 785-893-2803. All right. Well, we wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, we appreciate, you know, it's easy for people watching on YouTube. We can throw a slide up there and you all have that visual. Um, but uh, the people listening on podcast platforms like iHeartRadio or Apple Podcast or the folks listening on MTech it takes just a couple minutes for us to run through those. The other thing that I think that people don't know is where they want when the people with access to the Internet. If you go to the real world site, we're going to be publishing this calendar on there. So that's always going to be updated. If we're at a trade show or even our dealers are at a trade show for real world, if we know that they're at a, at a trade show where you can save shipping costs, visit the real world website and look at that calendar. It's always going to have our events on there. So Don, you, you already have been to Indiana for your, one of your first consulting visits. How did that go? Any takeaways from it, stories, and uh, what's it look like for the rest of consulting season? Well, I seen a really nice property uh, in, in Southern Indiana. Um, it, it's a property that has been enrolled in the WRP program and uh, they're gonna be constructing some wetlands and, and things on that property. But basically it's a, it was a blank canvas for me to 
come up with ideas and I've got some, I'm going to make a second trip back. Uh, I told the client that I wanted to throw out some ideas, but I also, um, those ideas have got to be run by the government agency that, that lays out the WRP and they may have ideas that differ from mine. So he's going to work with them, um, get some construction going on those wetlands and, and the exact placement of those. And then I'm going to come back at no additional charge to him just to make sure that, uh, you know, to, to fine tune everything after the government has their say in what they want to pay for. So it was a, it was a great way to start the, uh, the consulting season. Um, I've known this client for several years. Um, he's also, uh, an, a, a client of mine from last year is good friends with, with, uh, this client. They actually go to the same church and, and are in the same Bible study group. So, uh, he was there as well and become pretty good friends with those two gentlemen. And I um, look forward to going back and seeing that property when the government gets done with uh, their part of the project. Okay. That's gonna, that's a, I like how even though there's an extra factor involved in this, it's kind of some handholding and uh, follow up that, you know, when somebody chooses that as a consultant, it's not just a uh, meeting for five minutes and we give you a cookie cutter plan and then walk away. Uh, we, we consider all of these kind of more long term relationships that uh, will help and answer questions and be with you as you go on. So pretty cool opportunity for that that person who's uh, got that government program. It sounds cool. You, you know, I'm just getting rolling here, headed to Mississippi this coming week, uh, going to do one in Illinois this coming week. I'm not doing near as many as I have in the past, but I've still got more than I'd planned to do. I had a number that I wanted to shoot for, and I'm already at one and a half times that number and the and still getting emails and texts and phone calls every day. But uh, luckily, the Dream Team's picking up the slack, and, and you guys are, are going to be doing the majority of, of those that uh, come in from now on. But uh, Look forward to getting out of there. And like you said, Terry, when we meet these clients, a lot of times these guys just become friends and, um, you know, we text back and forth throughout the year and, you know, we'll talk about things even besides deer hunting. It might be politics or if somebody needs prayer for something or whatever. Um, it's just a great way for us to make friends and at, at the same time, you know, help people with their properties for us to make a living. Yeah. Ray and Aiden started as a consultant client for you and they were asking follow-up questions about separate tech underwear this week they wanted to know yeah. all about it well, <laughs> tell you, here's the big thing you need to tell them, them underwear need washed at least once every two weeks <laughs> that's the key, that's the key pivotal key pivotal part of that if they don't want the deer to smell them yeah you can't go a month without changing your underwear I can't wait till we see this text after we listen to this episode. So <laughs> no. Um, and I know I, I talked to, um, I've talked to some of the other consultants on the dream team. Um, make sure you're letting people know if you want on the list, because like in my case, I know everybody's filling up the sooner you let people know the better. And it also helps us make our logistics, you know, with, with how I'm doing it, um, I'm not traveling very far, but with these other guys, you know, they're going all over the country. So if they can package their trips in together and plan accordingly, it's a whole lot more efficient and, uh, you might not have to wait till next year to get it in. So let us know hunting yep. wise. Have you even been in the tree stand any this last week? Uh, this past week I had my, uh, uh, grandsons here staying uh, with us. My daughter and son-in-law went to the grand Canyon to do some hiking and the boys had the opportunity to go and they didn't think walking up and down hills for two days uh, sounded like very much fun when they could come to grandma and grandpa's and sit and watch TV and eat candy and drink pop and have all kinds of fun. So <laughs> we, we had them this week. I uh, did not, uh, I don't think I hunted a single time this week for the first time all season. I did knock on some doors uh, for hunting permission. That was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I talked to three different um landowners about permission to hunt the the first guy what was super interesting about this old guy I never met him in my life he lived about he lives about 30 miles or so from me knocked on his door came to the door and super super guy and uh i'm gonna guess he's probably at least in his mid 70s maybe older than that uh, and i told him who i was and and because he used to live in this area uh, where i live now and told him where I lived. And, uh, then I, 
I said, you might know uh, my grandpa from back in the day because I live on my grandparents' farm. I said, did you know Raymond Watkins? I, I'm his grandson. I live on his farm. His light, his eyes just lit up, and he said, your grandpa was my Sunday school teacher when I was a kid. No kidding. And I, I smiled and said, yeah. And, and, boy, he stepped out of the way, and he invited me into his house, and I sat there and talked to that old guy for probably an hour and a half <laughs> and about the people we knew. And he gave me permission to, to hunt his property that I was asking about, but he did tell me that there was somebody else hunting there and even told me the person's name. And I know the person I'm not going to step on their toes. It's a 40 acre property. And, and so I walked away from that one. And then I, uh, I went and visited throughout the week, two other landowners on for different properties that I had my eye on. And, uh, in both cases, somebody was already hunting there and, and I knew the other hunters. So, you know, they gave me permission to hunt too. I, I could walk in on all three of these properties I'm talking about. I got permission to go in there, but on every single one of them, there was somebody already there that I knew. And, and I'm not going to walk in on somebody that I don't know, um, let alone somebody I do know. So basically I got permission on three properties that I'm not going to hunt. <laughs> yeah, that's so, interesting. I, I sent, I found a, um, sent a letter to a, a landowner um i'm guessing before the first shotgun season of illinois uh, an adjoining property where i hunt never met him before but you know with me being out of state um i'm pretty cautious about just rocking up to somebody's door you know so usually i just i, I sent him a letter and introduced myself and said when i'm up in the area um, you know, I'd love to just stop in, just introduce myself. And, uh, I asked for permission to run a camera on a certain, when I was looking at Onyx, Onyx is such a great tool and said, you know, I don't really need to hunt your property, but I would really like to see this corridor transition to know, understand what the deer are doing more on, on my property and, uh, left my phone number and, and got a, an email address and got an email back from the, um, from the the lady that owns the property with her husband and got permission to hang cameras on there and they asked me to stop in and talk to them uh and introduce myself so that was pretty cool um it's a great it's a great pivot way to sometimes get access to a property is just you know start with running cameras start with coyote hunting start with something like that and build that relationship and it can go for years and years and years right anything to get your foot in the door yep doesn't and it help once when you get your foot in the door you, you make sure you keep on good terms with that landowner don't take, take them, them for granted yep absolutely well it's you can't show up a week before season and say oh you're gonna let me hunt again you know stay in contact yep. with them all year uh call them text them you know send them letters christmas cards all right well let's uh let's uh take a break and listen to a spot from osseo and then we're going to come back and talk about late season decisions and tactics Osseo Gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched, pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations. Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit osseogear.com. That's A-S-I-O gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear, prepare to be invisible. All right, Don. Well, I wanted to do this segment this week uh, as we're transitioning into late season. I know... Uh, Right now is the second shotgun week or shotgun weekend in Illinois. The the rifle season in Kentucky is over. I believe Ohio is Ohio still in or no? They're out already. I think that was last week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm not sure about Ohio, but you know I most think of it might go out tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. But most of the gun seasons are wrapping up. And I think that there could be a potentially two different scenarios that our listeners may be in. And the first one is their target buck is still alive. What do we need to change as far as our strategy for late season? Do we hunt mornings, evenings? Where do we hunt? We're going to talk a little bit about that first. So if your target buck is still alive or you think he's still there, what can I do to increase my odds? The second thing is, and I think that's this is the kind of the category you're in this year, 
And that is the target bucks that you have aren't there anymore, or you just don't have a shooter that you're wanting to go after, but have a tag. What is something that you can do to your property that, um, that can help or what are things that you can do to hurt? So let's just use this segment, late season tactics and decisions. Well, if you know, if your target buck's still alive, um, you need to be able to locate him. If you, you don't know where he's at, you, you better find him because once you get into that late season, they, they don't travel near like they do during the rut. They're, they're going to be keyed in on a prime food source, but they're also really going to be keyed in on a, an out of the way place. A lot of times, some place where there's no pressure, no human pressure. Is that because and, the gun season just finished and there's been so many yep. people in the woods? Well, if you, not just that, but if you look at the whole fall, you know, harvest has been going on with farmers in the in fields, you know, in the back corners of the property and here and there. And then you've had them coming back and working ground. You've had them in there spreading fertilizer, um, taking soil samples. Um, then you've got the archery season and small game season, coon hunting just on and on and on coyote hunting. So you've had just this influx of people in the last several weeks that, that have, you know, pushed those deer into the little, especially those mature bucks into those pockets that just have been overlooked and they're, they're few and far between, especially anymore, but you, you've got to figure out where that buck's spending his daylight hours. And then, you know, I think one of the real keys when you do have a target buck in the late season, is you have to be even more particular about picking your hunt. Um, you, you know, in the early season, you can get away with a whole lot more. There's a lot more vegetation. Those deer are not going to see you coming, slipping into your stand near as easy. Um, you, you can just uh, maybe get away with a little bit of uh, human activity. That Late season, there's, there's very little room for error. And, and the other thing in the late season is those bucks – have been pressured to the point that they're just most of the time, they're not going to get up from their bed until it's dark. So you need those, those weather fronts to get those deer up. And, and if you go in and, and try to hunt, you know, a warm sunny day where the temperature is 10 degrees above normal, um, you, you very well may see a deer, a bunch of deer, even especially on a green food source, but that mature buck, he is very likely to stay bedded until dark. And then you could bump him on climbing out of your stand or on your walk out of your stand. I think on these late season hunts, it's way more critical that you really pick and choose the days you hunt. And when the odds swing in your favor with that weather and you found your buck, you know where he's bedding, you know where he's feeding, um, then you got a chance. And the worse the weather, the colder it gets and you get some snow on the ground, especially if it's been there for several days and it's cold for several days your odds just keep increasing because that's just added stress and that buck needs to feed to stay alive and, and your odds build, but you don't want to ruin that chance before it happens. And, and I think that's what happens a lot of times, but if you can really pick and choose your hunts, um, sit back and, you know, we talk about it all the time, discipline. This is where discipline really, really comes in. So uh, in, in the late season, that discipline is going to pay off. And it's, it's not a bad thing too, uh, because most of us have hunted so hard during the rut, you know, all day sits. Um, it's not a bad thing to take a day off when you got real high winds or high temperatures and it's just not perfect. Um, that's the time to maybe take a day off, relax and, uh, and get your bearings and wait for that really, really nasty one to come out. But I think food is just such a vital part of our strategy in late season, and, um, you know, whether you, for example, there's a couple properties in Illinois that I have that once they chisel plow the field, there's no reason for those deer to even be there at that point. Um, especially with the, how many farmers are, we've talked about it doing double crop with there being weed out there. So all of that, mm -hmm. I think is going to dictate a lot of your decisions, right? Yeah, for sure. And this is where the serious land manager really has a opportunity to set his property apart from all the other properties in his neighborhood i mean it's one thing to plan a food plot that you're going to hunt over say in during your rut vacation but when it comes to late season you need some some major food sources and it needs to be grains it needs to be corn and soybeans 
And then when that cold weather hits, I'm telling you, those every deer in the neighborhood is going to be on their feet and they're going to be in a prime food source. Now, I know not everybody's got the opportunity to plant large plots of corn and soybeans. But if you do have that opportunity and you're not taking advantage of it, you're really missing the boat. Because in my opinion, the very best time to kill a mature buck on purpose, a very, a, one specific buck on purpose, is during the late season under a very set uh, of conditions. Um, you know, it's got to be cold. The colder, the better. If that cold front comes in for several days, your odds just increase with each passing day. When that happens, every nocturnal buck is no longer nocturnal. He's on his feet. He's headed to that food before the sun goes down. And if you know where he's coming from, where he's going, your odds of catching him are really, really good. All right. So let's transition this to the other side of somebody who either their target buck was shot by a neighbor or he hasn't turned up. Um, what are some strategies that you can put in? Because this kind of ties two directions. Number one, we can start getting into more management practices, which is where you're at this year. And then probably one of the most controversial and disputed things that you've ever said on this podcast is saying that you don't have new bucks show up until late season. In other words, you don't get the bucks that you have on your farm in the rut. You know about them, but occasionally mm -hmm. during late season, something new will show up. So let's talk through somebody that might be a little bit discouraged right now. They're down. They can't either. Um, somebody shot their target or haven't seen a buck that they want to do. Um, let's talk through that. Well, this is the time of the year when, when I'm in a situation like you just described where, where I don't have a shooter buck, where I'm doing serious herd management. I'm not talking about property management, doing habitat projects. I'm talking about working on the deer herd itself. This is the time of the year when I want to target those does that have twin buck fawns. I want to shoot every single one of them that comes by. And I want to use my buck tags on bucks that are never going to mount anything as far as, you know, have large antlers. And I'm focusing on bucks that are at least three and a half years old and uh, very few points. Those slick track um, eight pointers that are three years old, the odds of them ever being anything special is, is really pretty slim. And instead of allowing those bucks to mature even further and take space on the property, and, and eat food and, and, you know, create social stress and this and that, I just as soon use my two buck tags to shoot two of them. Now, the last thing I want to do is go out this week and shoot two bucks and then be without a buck tag. So, you know, my plan moving forward will be the first, I've got a list of about four target bucks, call bucks, management bucks, if you will, that I'd like to get shot this season. If I can find somebody to go hunting with me, well, I'm more than happy to let them be the one to, to carry the bow and do the shooting, and I'll just carry the camera. But if I'm on my own, the first one of them bucks that comes by is getting shot, no matter if it's the one I consider the very worst or one that's borderline. The first one to come by gets shot, and then I will hold my second buck tag until after the holidays. When we start getting into January, I'll shoot the next one because that, that gives me about a full month to wait for some bad weather to roll in and, and an opportunity for bucks that are not here currently to show up on the farm because of the food that I've had here for decades. So uh, you need to be strategic about it. You don't just go out there and start shooting deer wherever you want. I'm not going to be shooting deer out of certain stands, um, some of the best stands on the farm, but uh, stands on food sources or, you know, out of the way places where I, I'm not going to put that much pressure on the property. That's where I'm going to be shooting these deer. Yeah. Um, a couple, couple spinoff comments of there. We talk about culling ideas and techniques on this um, and people take us so literal. I mean, to the, you know, we, we can make a, we can make a statement and they remember things a whole lot more than what we say. Some of these smaller bucks, um, it doesn't mean that we tell everybody to go kill every eight pointer on their property. What you're evaluating is the weaker bucks in each age class. So if we look at our three-year-olds, there's a two slick rack eight pointers. And then there's another one that you've identified, whether it be an extra point or he's got a 10 point frame or a possible kicker. That's the one we want there. So it's not, 
we've had multiple people call us and say he's an eight pointer. Should I shoot him? That's all depends on what else is on your farm. Your right. your best buck in your age class of a three year old or four year old or mature buck could be an eight pointer. We're not saying kill that deer. So um, in Don's case, in this, I know a little bit more information because of trail camera pictures and such that he sends me, and we talk about and being on the farm as much as I have. Uh, these are decisions that it's the weaker bucks in each age class that we're saying. So don't, although we're using a slick rack eight pointer as an example, don't take it so literally that if it's an eight pointer, you got to kill it. So I right. want to make that clarification. Because an eight point year and a half old buck is a super, super good yearling. You, you need to know the age or you, you need to be fairly good at, at aging bucks on the hoof. And you know, that's not an exact science either, but you can tell a mature buck from an immature buck. And if you've, if you're really in tune with your property, um, you've got trail camera history of your bucks for the last several years. And, and you recognize when, by the time they're three years old, you should be able to recognize them as individuals. And that's when you want to start targeting them. I, I, I don't promote targeting yearling bucks or two year old bucks. Give them a chance to grow that third rack. And by that point, they, they should show you what they're going to mount to. Yeah, this isn't a situation where Don Don's going out into his farm and sees an eight-pointer and, oh, I need to shoot this one. There is hours and hours and hours of studying and inventorying the, the bucks on your property to identify those. That, that target list gets made in your office at that desk you're sitting at right now. Not when you're in a tree and and start seeing an eight pointer and you've hunted hard and oh, I'm going to fill my tag. There's an eight pointer. Don said to shoot it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not it at all, folks. That is <laughs> not it at all. And you know what? What's going to be interesting at this year's master classes, Terry, is uh, you know I there, there's so much misinformation out there on the internet that I, I get questions all the time about you know doe factories and. You can only hold one mature buck, so you you got to create these various little pockets in, in, on your property for this mature buck. He'll stay over here, and this one will stay over here. Folks, it does not work like that whatsoever. But at the master class this year, I'm going to show photos, and I'm not going to show them on the Internet because uh, there's just too many people out there that would try to take advantage of the situation. But to the folks at the class, I'm going to show you um, some of the bucks that were alive on this farm this year. Um, and you're going to be shocked. I think, I think it, everybody will be shocked at the number of mature bucks. Now I'm not saying there's a bunch of giants, but there was a bunch of bucks that were, you know, over Age three plus. and a half years old. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when, we, when we're talking with consulting clients, I think people have to understand their phases of managing your property. You have to create it to where you're attracting and holding deer. You have to manage it to where deer get to older age classes. And then you have to manage the herd so that the best of those deer have the opportunity to live. And it's, it's in different phases, but for the most part, you're not going to get giant bucks unless you have age structure and um, you're not going to have age structure if you're not managing or you're putting too much pressure on your property. So it all goes hand in hand. Um, there's no magic wand that you can just wave over it and say, in one year, I'm going to do this or buy this product or even plan a real world food plot. And I'm going to have giants. It's, 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 we have a new slogan we're going to be talking about with real world this year called all in. And to get to that level, it's multiple pieces far beyond the products that we sell. Um, if, if, if we could make a product that could produce that, we, we'd have a whole lot more business than what we do now. And, um, you know, we're just going to be honest with people. It's, it's, a, it's a multiple phases to this. Right. Yep, there's so, no shortcuts and it takes a lot of discipline. So to finish up this segment about late season, I want to talk just a little bit about the bucks that just miraculously show up or, you know, they figure out. So, um, you know, that Don has food on his property. Let's go six miles to the west. There's no Facebook post that says, hey, there's food over here. Um, as we finish up this topic, there's been a theory that you've talked about uh, on and off on the podcast. And... Um, I'm going to set it up just a little bit more with some comments that we hear often from, from listeners. 
what's the use in me doing so much of this work for spring food plots and habitat if the buck dispersal, you know, that maternal aggression is just going to push those bucks away from the mother. I'm just, I'm managing these bucks and feeding mineral and food plots and doing all this work so the neighbors can shoot them. And, uh, you know, we're not ever going to keep every deer on our property, Mm -hmm. but I think you've talked about a, a theory about why these bucks could potentially show back up because they can't smell a soybean field from six miles away. Right. And, uh, you know, I've, I scratched my head for years, um, decades ago when, when I, this farm really started coming on into its own and really became something special, uh, during the late season, I, I would have more deer here than at any time during the year. And I would have a lot of bucks showing up that were not here during the rut whatsoever. And I sit in my stand and blinds so many days, scratching my head, thinking about how do these bucks know this food is here? Who who tells them, how do they figure it out? Because these aren't bucks that were just coming from the neighbors. Cause I've got a unique situation where I've got trail cameras in about every direction from my farm. And and so I I'm kind of, you know, I'm in tune with the, the deer herd you know, this buck that's on my farm, I know he summers over here, say to the south. And this other buck on my farm, I know he summers to the north. And because I just get their pictures on the farm as well as off the farm. But in the wintertime, I have these bucks showing up that not only were they never photographed on my farm, they were also never photographed in the two or three miles surrounding my farm. So where do they come from? Well, a few years back, I, I developed a theory and, and I, I, I was sitting in my blind one day and I was watching all these deer feeding and there was, there was bucks of every age class. There was does and there was fawns. And uh, I was watching this doe and buck fawn feeding there. And I'm thinking, you know what, that fawns, that buck fawn is probably going to disperse this spring. Uh, just mother nature's way. We've talked about that a lot, a lot on this podcast. He, he's going to disperse and. I'm setting him up for somebody else, just like we get the questions coming in. And then it hit me, you know, I wonder if, if what's happening is these fawns are spending, these buck fawns are spending their first winter with their mother on my farm, eating all this food. Then the next spring they disperse and, you know, research has shown that in farm country, like what I'm at, uh, the average dispersal for a year and a half full or yearling buck is five to 20 miles so he may end up 20 miles from my place well i got to thinking when times get and and these new bucks come in when the weather is the worst if we have a really mild winter i do not get that influx of these new bucks but if we get a brutal cold spell for two or three weeks with snow i'm telling you what they keep they come and they just keep coming and my theory is that these bucks that are coming in were here the winter that they were fawns. They were here with their mother the first winter of their life. They know it's the land of plenty because I never run out of food. I got enough food plots here. I never run out of food. And I think they disperse, say, 10 miles away. And then we get a really rough winter and they can't find a good food source. I think that those are the bucks that are coming back, bucks that were born here. So like you said, Terry, that was a fantastic point. Um, We do all this work, have these fawns, these buck fawns disperse and, and, you know, we think we're setting up other people because we've got a good nutrition program. Um, our does have been on a good nutrition program for years. So that whole fetal programming aspect comes into play. And then these bucks leave and we've just, everything that we've worked for is gone. But I think there's a great opportunity that or possibility rather that those buck fawns do return under the right conditions. I think that the theory holds the most water because you've seen tangible differences the years that it's bitter cold or bad weather versus a mild winter, which just tells me that if it's not that bad or there's a food source somewhere else, they're probably just feeding there. But the worse it gets, um, you know, the, you know, the more snow or the bitter cold temps where they need more grain. Uh, they're going to go back to what they remember and what they remember is some place that they were either spent time with their mother or they passed through at some point. So um, I think it's just a great opportunity to give people a little bit of encouragement. Um, 
Let's talk real quick before we move on about how how long we hunt mornings and evenings. I know both of us are more of evening hunters in the uh, late season. We don't I don't do a lot of morning hunting at all in the in the late season. But uh, you know, I think uh, talk a little bit about the time you go into the stand versus how cold it is because I think the colder it is, the earlier you need to be in. Right. Well, late season, I almost never hunt a morning. I mean, if I hunt in the morning, it's just because I've got nothing else to do. And, uh, you know, maybe I want to shoot a doe or something. I, I don't hunt morning. I mean, if I hunt one morning in the late season, every five years, that that's a lot of just to hardly ever do it, but it's all, all afternoon. Um, and you're exactly right, Terry on the, the worse, the weather, the earlier you need to be there. My typically I, I try to get to my afternoon stand about two to two and a half hours at least two hours before dark, uh, two and a half is better, but you know, when that weather gets brutal, being there three hours before dark, even if you go in right after lunch, if you can stand it, especially if you're in a situation where you've got a blind, um, where you can have a little propane heater in that blind, you know, midday, sometimes those deer are coming out when it's zero out, you know, at night and single digits is high during the day, those deer are likely to be feeding out there at high noon. So, and, and you're you, hunting, you're hunting food sources at that point. Absolutely. Um, it, it's just so tough to get back in the bedding areas under those conditions without those deer detecting you. I mean, when everything's white and they can see you coming across the field, no a cover, mile away, yeah, no, yeah cover. no cover in the trees and every little noise just seems to be magnified. Yeah. I, I'm sitting right on the edge of the food source where those deer are piling out of the cover. Yeah, I got a I got a funny story about sneaking into a stand that I didn't share on the podcast the other day. But when I was up in Illinois a couple of weeks ago, we had this freak snowstorm that one night. I think it was on a Sunday night or something. And and mm-hmm. uh, what I didn't realize is I, I go to a different section of the farm. I didn't realize they had chisel plowed. Well, I was just there two days before, three days before, and didn't realize they chisel plowed. Well, then the snow came and there was like what three four inches of snow in different places right. yep. but the ground wasn't frozen so i get on my quiet cat and instead of driving all the way around the field i'm just going to shoot right across the the, the picked <laughs> the picked bean field and i got in that soft chisel plowed dirt and got out in the middle of it and it just started slowing down slowing down and i geared up to the higher gear and started pedaling as hard as i could and all of a sudden it just the bike just comes to a stop and i thought oh crap <laughs> and i went to put my foot down and it was too late it just so i got to hunt the rest of the day covered in wet and wet nasty muddy snow but uh <laughs> it was it was quite funny it was a weird circumstance where uh the ground wasn't frozen but we had four inches of snow and i didn't realize it had been t- chisel plowed underneath of it yeah that was a uh there's a freak snow because south of us southern illinois actually got seven inches in some places we got about four here where i'm at i but, think that uh, was the get... same front that went through that buffalo area and up by the finger lakes got like five feet or something like that yeah i think they even had to move an nfl game out of there because it was too uh too much snow all right well i appreciate i appreciate the dialogue on late season decisions and tactics uh for the people who still have a tag um, you know, offer a little bit of encouragement that, that, that good things can happen, but, uh, strategy is probably more important now than any time of the year. Yeah. I mean, I'm already gearing up for next season, um, knocking on those doors this week for permission. You know, I wasn't going to hunt those properties this year. I was just going to go put cameras on them. Um, managing my deer herd, I'm managing it for next year and in, and in the future. And to be honest, I, I like sitting in my stand in the late season and just, you know, looking out over my property and thinking of the different projects, I habitat projects I need to do before the next season. And a lot of times I'm on my phone taking those notes of things I want to get done. And, you know, it's a good time to reflect on, you know, the things that went right this season and also to note the things that we can do better next year. All right. We got a couple questions that are going to kind of spin off of that dialogue, so we'll hold that. Buyafarm.com is your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. Now, here is Don Higgins with this week's featured property.
Well, welcome to the Biofarm segment. I am joined with Don Bailey from Biofarm.com, and he's on the episode tonight to talk about two different properties. And Don, you're going to tee up the first one from Cumberland County that has multiple tracks to it. So let's jump right in since we have two properties to talk about tonight and uh, kick off this one in Cumberland County, Illinois. Yes, Terry, the Cumberland County is 180 acres. Uh, it's being offered in four tracks or multi-par combination of tracks. Uh, tracks run from 20 to 80 acres. Uh, it's south of Greenup, Illinois, again in Cumberland County. Each track has some tillable on it, supplying some income, uh, and each track has access. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures that are scrolling through on uh, the buyfarm.com website. It looks like some of the properties, or excuse me, some of the tracks, if not all of them, might have some timber on it. You got a couple pictures of a ball cap hanging on a tree. So, uh, you know, there is some uh, different terrains. It looks like some creeks, some woods, some open country. You could probably do about anything you wanted with a clean slate here. Yes, it's got a, it's got a lot of opportunities. The bidding on the track is open now, Terry, and it closes December the 15th at 8 p.m. Okay. On this day. So the total, the total property is 180 acres, and it's divided into four tracks where if somebody wanted a smaller track uh, to just hunt on, build a house, do whatever, um, that would be available to bid on separately. And the largest track of 80 acres, it's got a lot of woods on it. So if you didn't want the 180, you could separate and probably bid on that uh, individually. So a couple different options for somebody with different price ranges and different uh, kind of wants and needs out of a piece of property. But this is an online auction, Cumberland County, Illinois, on buyafarm.com's website. And you said the property, the bidding is open now and closes on December 15th. Yes, Terry. The second property is in Clay County, Illinois. It's a 45-acre tract total. It has 31 acres enrolled in CRP that pays $174 an acre, which is around $5,500 a year. It has some awful good hunting opportunities on it. The south end of the track is, has got some big woods, and then it has fence rows and woods intermined around the rest of the track. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the same. It closes December the 15th at 8 p.m. also, Terry. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about this property. The thing that I like about it is it's got a bunch of open ag to it, but there's some fingers of woods that kind of connect it. So if the deer hunters are, are listening to this, um, you're going to have 45 acres that's going to hunt a whole lot bigger than 45 acres just because of where this is nestled in with open ag and connecting woods. So uh, even though you might only have 45 acres, you're going to have a lot of deer from a lot of different directions on this one, I believe. Yes, absolutely. And it's and it's the kind of track that, uh, you know, unless they're just overly pushed, they're, they're going to stay there. Yeah. Uh, this, this, as I say, it's got it all. It's got a creek runs through the south. Each corner of it has tillable land you know food sources around it and then has timber to the east i mean to the west and to the south of it so right. yes it's it's got a lot going for it terry yep so this this one is all bidding is is also open on this property in clay county and it also closes on december 15th so if people have questions about either one of these two properties uh why don't you drop your contact information here and then we'll always push people to the biofarm.com website and your social media yes uh just just give me a call anytime don bailey at 618-919-1031 or email me at dbailey at biofarm.com. And then, of course, anytime they need to, just go directly to Biofarm. All the information of the auctions are there. And if any issues or any problems or any misunderstanding of how to register for the auctions, give me a call, and I'll be glad to walk anybody through it, Terry. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing these two properties. Again, uh, these are going to close out bidding on December 15th. So if you're interested in learning more, contact Don Bailey or visit the biofarm.com website. Have a good one, Don. Thank you, Terry. Bye-bye. Okay, the first one comes from Jordan Blummer from Stralsburg, Illinois, right down the road from me. 
Uh, he says, hey, Don and Terry, my question is when you guys are out consulting on properties, has there ever been a time when you consulted on adjacent landowners? Is there a certain way you would do this or do you not even take on the client in the first place because of checkerboard square idea? Thanks and God bless. Um, well, Jordan, uh, you know, ironically, I'm getting ready to head to Ohio and do a consulting visit on two adjoining properties for two, you know, neighbors. And uh, I, I'm fine with that. I, I tell my clients all the time that, uh, you know, a lot of them will say, I'm trying to get my neighbor to call you too. And I'm saying, I tell them, well, you don't want your neighbor to call me because you want to be doing something totally different than your neighbor. You don't want me to go there and tell him to do something very similar to what I'm having you do. Um, because then you're going to be sharing the deer. And if you want your property to be the best in the neighborhood, you need to be doing something different. But in, in this case, that I actually have got, got them on the calendar here for the next couple of weeks in, in Ohio. Um, I, I'm fine with two neighbors working together. I, in fact, I would rather neighbors work together than against each other. Um, to be honest, that, that's pretty rare. Um, we may all be deer hunters, but uh, what I've found is that there's a lot of deer hunters that um, – have big mouths when it comes to what they they're going to do but when it comes to really really getting down and doing it putting the effort forward most of them are not going to do it um they talk big yeah i'm going to pass 150 inch buck yeah well they're going to pass him until the first time he walks by and then then it's all over um so if you can work with your neighbors that's great and, and i'm fine with it um but if if there's any kind of issue whatsoever um, you're probably better off not to, um, just, you know, take care of your property, let your neighbor take care of his, get along with him for sure, you know, work together when you can, but, uh, sometimes it's better just to, uh, do things your own way and, and by yourself. Yeah. I don't think if I had a, if I had a client from last year and then his neighbor called me this year, I don't think I would go in and do that project without the other my my current customer partner or friend being on board with it I, and you know when you hire us that means something it gets to a level of family and a circle that we're all in and i'm not going to do anything to uh to ruin what we've done with somebody who's already been a customer so mm -hmm. all right well let's move on to the second question okay this one comes from ryan kimler from wentzville missouri he says Don and Terry, I have heard you both talk about goals and discipline a lot on the podcast. I have had a goal of shooting a mature buck four and a half years or older for the last 17 seasons. I have not given in on that goal and I have not succeeded. My question is, if you look at the sport of basketball, for example, not everyone makes the high school team, not everyone makes the college team, and not everyone makes it to the pros. Is there a cutoff level like that in the sport of deer hunting? Have I set a goal that I am not capable of meeting? I know there are four and a half year old bucks and older on the farm of my hunt because of trail cameras. Is there a point I should give up and quit? I don't have a problem eating tags and not shooting two and three year olds. Shooting two and three year olds doesn't light a passion inside of me. However, the compiling years of failure and disappointment are starting to weigh on me, especially given the time I put in during the off season and hunting the right days and learning as much as I can to do better. Thank you for your time and thoughts. Best of luck to you both the rest of the season. Um, well, Ryan, the first thing that jumps out at me about your submission is that your goal is four and a half to kill a four and a half year old buck. And those bucks do exist right now on your property. It would be totally different if you were telling me that you were trying to grow those bucks and you just couldn't um, for whatever reason. And there are certain properties that you're never going to. You're, you, most properties, the neighbors are going to have a certain level of influence. And But in your case, the bucks that you, that you desire to kill, your goal bucks, they are there. And if they are there, they are killable. And, and that just tells me that you, you've got to do something different. And I don't know what it is it is but you know the one definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different result 
And I, I heard that years ago, I'm talking like 25, 30 years ago, I recognize that if I'm going to do the same thing I've been doing, I'm going to get the same results I've been getting. If I do what every other deer hunter does, I'm going to get the same results that every other deer hunter gets. I've got to do things different. And if what I'm doing is not working, I've got to change some things. And, you know, I don't know the specifics of you and how you hunt or your property, how it's laid out and how you hunt it or anything like that. My best advice to you is you got to totally change up what you've been doing because I, you know, obviously after 17 years, 17 years on the same property, you ought to just flat out luck into at least one or two, four and a half year old bucks if they are there every season. Uh, and the fact that you're there for 17 seasons and still don't have one, you, you've got to really change up what you've been doing. And, and what that means, I have no idea because, like I said, I don't know the details of how you hunt or your property, but you've got to change things up big time. Yeah, something something's up. And if it's, you know, it might be that he's getting, we can only answer questions based on what, what is in, you know, the submission. It might just be that he has four-year-olds on uh, pictures in the middle of the night, no daylight pictures. Well, that means you're on the wrong property or you need right. to change your property to have them there in daylight. That's, that's probably one of the biggest things we do with consulting clients is changing their property. And so that the, the bucks are there during daylight hours, they're betting on you. You know, I, I still find it hilarious. We we have a food plot seed company and we talk about betting more than we do food for the most part when we're doing consulting. That's how vital it is. So, um, yeah, it might be the wrong property. It might be the wrong techniques. Um, I can just tell you that the biggest pushback that we get when we're talking at trade shows or seminars or consulting visits is we try to come up with ideas to do what we talk about on this podcast and we get pushback from the from the client or the friend or the person that we're talking to and the and the statement back is well in 1998 I shot a 170 here and that works so I'm going to keep doing the same thing uh the stuff that we're trying to do is so you can kill those bucks every year not once every 20 years so um for what for what was submitted in the question i think you answered it as best you can um outside of that i don't know where to go with it so we've been asked to share a thank you note from the family of a little girl that we recently helped montana the mother wrote a thank you note that we're going to read to you but we also wanted to share some of the pictures of this little girl and her new wheelchair. We were able to pay the balance of what the insurance wouldn't cover and the family couldn't afford. And it's just so neat to see this little girl smiling as she's using her new piece of equipment. Thank you so much to all the donors who helped make this possible. Dear Lester's Feet Foundation, we wanted to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the gift you gave us. You not only gave my daughter a wheelchair that she needed, you gave her the freedom of mobility. She is getting really good at controlling it on her own, and she definitely goes too fast for this mama. We would not have this wheelchair if it wasn't for your foundation, as Medicaid refused to cover one. Juniper is able to make more decisions for herself, like to come toward me or move away from me or toward her friends. She will start preschool soon and this changes everything for her physically and socially. Thank you again. The next one comes from Clint Cross from Sanborn, Indiana. He says, Don, I heard on last week's podcast that you are hoping to get permission on a couple of different properties to find a buck you was tipped off on. My question is, how are you placing those trail cameras this time of the year? Only on food sources or on trails going from food to bedding, or do you have another approach? Thank you for all the help, Clint. Uh, well, Clint, I, I told the story earlier in the podcast about uh, how I did gain access to, to these properties, but uh, there's already hunters on them and I'm not going to go in and step on the toes. So I'm not going to get to chase the buck I was tipped off on apparently. Um, but if I was to gain access to a new property and, and go in to put trail cameras up this time of the year, obviously I'm going to key in on food sources because 
they're going to be on those food sources for the rest of the winter. Um, if there's any, uh, you know, trails coming into those food sources, especially if, if there's funnels along those trails, uh, maybe they're, they're going through a hole in a fence or an open gate or something to get to a food source. I'll, I'll obviously have trails or, um, trail cameras there. Um, it, it just varies. You know, I, I don't, I, I've got probably 50 trail cameras out right now and they're all on, you know, different situations. Some are on rope scrapes and some are on funnels and, um, some are on food sources. So, uh, you, you just gotta, you, you know, when you, you don't know what's on the property, you go in with two or three or four trail cameras, um, in, in your pack and you just set them up on different things that you find. I think, um, I, we could do a, you could do a whitetail master Academy video on this if you haven't already, but going in like this for a preliminary investigation or, you know, um, kind of evaluation of a property or trying to locate a buck is one thing, but I think that there's, there's kind of a lost art. We talk about developing stand locations. I think you can also develop trail camera locations over time. And, you know, if that's a, I, I've seen you do this so many times is, is if you end up finding that this is a good spot that you're going, that you gain permission to, there's, there's strategies you can use that maybe you need to make a video on this, on how to develop, um, uh, trail camera, uh, locations, just like tree stand locations, because man, it, it's, it's so easy to just put a, a camera up face in a field and something about those mature bucks, they'll skirt that thing and go around it, go around the backside. I don't know how they do it. It's like a sixth sense, but, um, you can do things to manipulate that terrain to where you're going to get those pictures where they're going to be in front. So, um, yeah. good question, Clint. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing to think about, especially over the winter as you're getting access before those, those antlers shed. And by the way, Clint, uh, tell the wife the apple butter was on point. It met the approval of my wife. So uh, Clint's wife uh, made us some homemade apple butter and uh, sent it to us. So I got to thank her. Thank her for that. Well, I didn't get mine. It's in my it's in my basement here. I got to bring it next time I come up. Well, hey, I got a new quiet cat in my shed for you. So yeah, I'll trade you. I'll trade you a quiet cat bike for uh, some apple butter. All right, there we go. Well, the Quiet Cat bike that you mentioned, we want to thank Quiet Cat. Um, you mentioned that that both of our new bikes arrived. So, uh, have you put yours together yet? I have not. I have not had a chance, but uh, maybe tomorrow after church. Yeah. So we uh, we have the new generation bike that we're going to demo for them this year. Um, a lot of people. Uh, we've sent a lot of few people to our buddies over there here recently. And, uh, I've offered this on the podcast before. If you have a question, Don and I will be the first to admit what we're not good at. And we're not good at listening to what your topography is, what you want to use a quiet cat for, and then recommending a specific model. And quiet cat has an awesome inside sales team that if you give us a, a private message or, uh, an email, we can put you in touch. We have um, one or two guys assigned to the customers and listeners of Higgins Outdoors or the Chasing Giants podcast that will just talk with you on the phone, understand your needs. Um, they talk to us, and we're going to be demoing a new bike. So I get to pick mine up on the next trip, and both of them got shipped to Don's house. So looking forward to that, and we want to thank them for their support along with all of our other sponsors also. The next one comes from Trevor Hagen from Kokomo, Indiana. He says, Don and Terry, do you guys feel like the difficulty of archery hunting doesn't get talked about enough, specifically on smaller tracks that most hunters hunt? It's frustrating to see all this information on the internet and then must filter through people's credibility because they aren't transparent about what weapon they are killing these deer with or how big the parcel is that the deer was killed on. I think a lot of inexperienced bow hunters get discouraged because some of these tactics people are putting out that are meant for rifle hunters. I appreciate the fact that every week when I turn on your podcast, I can relate to your information. I send every bow hunter I know to listen to your podcast. Keep up the good work. Um, well, Trevor, I know exactly what you're talking about. There's a, uh, a person puts out a lot of land management videos that uh, 
not going to mention any names and don't want to turn this personal, but you just, you never see the guy shooting, you know, mature bucks with a bow. Um, I'm not saying never, it's pretty rare, put it that way. Not consistent for sure. Um, you, you don't see him showing video footage of truly mature bucks um, doing whatever he's talking about in his videos. Um, and it's more than one person, really. The whole internet is, is full of it. Uh, you know, that That's really why I, I used the term real world years ago. Uh, my first book was Hunting Trophy Whitetails in the Real World. Uh, when I started the the food pot seed company. It was real world wildlife products. My second book, real world whitetail icons. And because for a long time, I thought that a lot of the information being put out by the experts, if you will, or um, the influencers um, just was not real world information. And uh, we, I think we talked about it last week or the week before that, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there just sharing misinformation. It's not firsthand experience. They don't have the experience. They're just passing along stuff that they've picked up from somebody else, whether it be through magazine articles or on the internet or whatever, and they just repeat it. And, you know, Terry and I joked uh, the other day after, uh, I forget what topic it was that we talked about that hadn't been ever brought up before. And Terry said, you just watch. There'll be six podcasts talking about this same topic within the next 30 days. And uh, he's absolutely right. I, I think, uh, you know, when you put out um, fresh information that hasn't been out there before, there's there's people just waiting to jump on it. And it's not firsthand information. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, you got to really watch your sources and, and, and uh, w- when you're deciding, you know, what to believe. So, I mean, I don't know what else to say without really turning it personal and picking out individuals. And yeah, I don't really want to do, we need to, do that. We're going to stay away from that. I mean, um, <laughs> Lord knows we've made the mistake of running our mouth on this podcast or on other podcasts or things and, and throwing out little digs and stuff. It, it That's not what we're about, but, uh, Trevor, I can, I I don't want to either get you further disappointed, but I can share a little bit of a story about my journey in the outdoor industry that started 18 years ago. And that's pretty much why I had the opinion when Don wanted me to do this podcast, I didn't want anything to do with it. The, the overall hunting industry that we see is you gotta, you gotta realize that it's about entertainment. It's not about education for the most part. And when I first dabbled in this, I was doing some business consulting work for people with branding projects and totally behind the scenes. And what I first saw was just, I, I couldn't handle it. You know, it would be, I would know for a fact that somebody was shooting a bow with a certain broadhead and then would have other arrows that they would change the broadhead out and have to redo B roll footage of them pulling the bow back to produce the film for, um, what what ended up being on a dvd or on tv the amount of outdoor television and and youtube channels that buy real world stuff that we see the order come through and ship it to them and then you pull up their video and it's got one of our competitors logos hunting over our product it it's it's just amazing to see how the industry really works and i'm not I I hope people don't take this as a dig, but I can tell you it's very frustrating because there's so much just, um, I don't know, people, people have made it about entertainment. And if you're, if you're looking to it as entertainment and you know that going in, I think you're fine. Um, I think where your question's going though, is how people mislead. And unfortunately I don't want to discourage you even more. There's probably more misleading, um, stories, uh, articles, videos put out there than people realize. I mean, um, I've even seen, <laughs> I've even seen very famous footage of, of a reaction of a guy going nuts after killing a deer 
uh, that got produced and and I'm sure most of the people listening to this podcast may have even seen the the specific footage but they don't realize there was seven takes to that reaction. I've seen I've seen the B-roll footage that was produced into the final thing. So I, I think you just have to separate it, trust the sources that you really look into, dig into them, find people with the credibility, and understand that it's entertainment, and hopefully you get something out of it. Um, if you're really looking for advice and direction, find someone that aligns with what your goals are. If if the person you're looking for looking at for advice doesn't doesn't uh, kind of have the same story or goals that you do, there's probably not going to be a lot of takeaways from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of pe- people trying to be heroes in the hunting industry, and uh, Wes Delks taught me a, a saying that uh, I, I've really it's really stuck with me um, in, in the past few months and. It, Wes's dad used to tell him, don't worry about being a hero out in the world, be a hero at home. And I, I've had to, you know, remind myself since Wes first told me that a few months ago, I, I remind myself quite often, don't worry about being a hero out in the world. I, I need to be a hero at home to my family. You know, my grandson, I need to do things that are going to make my grandsons proud. Um, not worry about somebody on the internet. And, uh, at the end of the day, if you do that, everything's going to fall into place. Uh, I'm not perfect. Terry's not perfect. Um, but one thing we are, we, we're, we're real. What you see is what you get. Um, I think we've ruffled some feathers in the hunting industry just because we're, we're so candid about our, with our conversation, but it is what it is. And, and, you know, Trevor makes, makes a, a statement in here. He's like, uh, that some of these some inexperienced hunters get discouraged because of all the facts well i can tell you that you know there's going to be a lot of things we talk about on this podcast that does not align with a lot of hunters and that's okay um you know we're we're talking about a very elite style of um target buck that we're going after but it's it's kind of like what you talked about uh I, i forget where the first time i heard you mention this when we, I think it came up when you were talking about um, cutting lanes through the switchgrass field. And you said some bucks use it, but some bucks won't. And if we, if we study things that we can kill the hardest buck on the property, the easy bucks, we can do that too. But if we develop our strategy to kill the easy ones or the three-year-olds, and that's how we do it, um, it's going to be really hard to kill the hard one. So I think what we do on this podcast is try to highlight the things that are ideas to spark uh, just uh, thoughts for your property and your hunting season to kill the hardest buck out there. And then hopefully whatever you decide to do with that comes out a positive for you. Right. All right. Well, last question here before the night, and then I'll put it up right now. Okay. This one comes from John Soteros from Arnold, Maryland. He says, Don and Terry, first, thanks for the No Nonsense podcast. I look forward to your episodes every week. My question is for Don. I have several five to seven acre patches of real world switchgrass. I know deer don't eat switchgrass and given deer eat five times a day, what can I do to get deer to use my switchgrass for bedding more? I never go into any of my switchgrass and while deer do use it at the height of gun season to hide from my brown and down neighbors. They don't seem to use it much the rest of the year. My assumption is that it's because there isn't any food in there. Thanks for your help and God bless. Um, Well, John, um, you know, first of all, the idea that you need food mixed with your switchgrass is one of those ideas that's promoted a lot on the internet by a lot of so-called experts and i don't know who came up with this idea it may sound good in theory i think it's a terrible idea i always advise against it because i want my food on my property to be separate from my bedding cover i don't want a buck to just get up and put his nose down and start feeding in the clover that's growing in the switchgrass i want him to get up and move to the food source that movement is what makes him killable if he doesn't have to move, if he's got his bed and his food right all together right there, um, 
he's going to be way harder to kill. Um, as far as your switchgrass not holding deer, um, I, I think you really hit on it when you said they do use it during gun season when the pressure's at the highest. That tells me that they've got other options that provide them the security they need except during gun season. During gun season, that extra push, extra human activity, more hunters in the woods probably puts some pressure on the places those deer bed the, the rest of the year, and that causes them to move to your switchgrass. Um, I, I found switchgrass to be fantastic bedding cover. I've got, uh, I, I said it before, that I've noticed some individual bucks will prefer the switchgrass over the wooded cover. Others seem to prefer the wooded cover over the switchgrass. Um, your situation, you say your patches are five to seven acres. That's big enough that the, the deer should be utilizing them. But I, I've just got to guess that they've also got other options they like better for whatever reason um, close by. And at, when gun season rolls around, the pressure on those areas is pushes them to your switchgrass. Yep. Great thoughts. And you mentioned, um, you mentioned in there, you don't want a deer standing up and feeding. And I'm not saying that John implied this by any means. So John, don't, I'm, I don't want you to think I'm twisting your words, but, um, the style of switchgrass bedding that we want is so thick. Nothing would grow in it. We, right. we want this thing to be an ab, you know, that's another thing that somebody said once a switchgrass can be too thick that the deer won't use it. Um, if you see the trails that go inside of our switchgrass plots, um, it's like canals or caves. It's not that the deer won't find a way to navigate through it. But um, if that switchgrass is thin enough that you could actually plant something and grow, then your switchgrass stand isn't good enough. Right. Absolutely. That's my opinion. That's my opinion anyway. I mean, you, you might be able to put a little plot in the side of it, but how do you access the plot? Yeah. Well, I know there's a lot of... Uh land managers or consultants whatever that recommend that you don't have a monoculture of switchgrass that you have forbs and clovers and things like that mixed in and you grow it all at once but i'm telling you terry can vouch for me these straight stands of switchgrass are absolutely fantastic the deer hide in them they make beds in them they make tunnels through it um you could hide a truck in your switchgrass field. It's it's that tall, that thick. I remember the the first time Wes and Madison, Wes Delks brought his wife Madison up and we were shed hunting and walked through the switchgrass field, uh, the front switchgrass field that the people that watched the Smokey and the Mel video, it was that field. And uh, I think Madison got turned around and started yelling. We had to go find her because, I mean, this stuff, yeah. when I say when I say it's a cave, this stuff is way up over your head and you're walking a path that your shoulders rub up against. And then there's all these intersections and then all these spots where, where your deer are backing in up against it and bedded down, uh, such great cover and habitat. So if, if, uh, maybe it's a newer switchgrass field too, we don't know. John didn't say how long, mm. how many years it had been established, but that might be uh, also part of it is it's not fully established yet. So, mm -hmm. all right. Absolutely. So you, what do you got planned this week, Terry? Depends on the weather. Um, so uh, we didn't talk any about this at the beginning. I didn't want to make this a Debbie Downer episode, but uh, before we close out of here, um, I lost an employee um, this week at work. And uh, he was a Japanese engineer that had come over, uh, had 37, just turned 37 years old. And he was working at a customer this summer and got some abdominal pain and we had to bring him home and he was diagnosed with a very rapid form of stomach cancer. And, uh, he passed away this week. Um, sorry to hear that prayers to pretty, his family. Pretty tough situation. He has a, um, a four year old son and a 18 month old daughter, but, um, we're going to we're going to take care of that family somehow this week. There's a lot of the Japanese culture does not have wills and testaments. And uh, so from a business standpoint to uh, make sure that the uh, mother and those kids are taken care of, um, that's the first kind of order of business that we're going to make sure as a company and a group of friends that worked with him are going to take care of that. 
Um, but I ask for prayers for this situation. Um, one of the one of the things that was kind of heavy on my heart was, you know, the Japanese culture and they're not Christians. And I thought, you know, I didn't do a service when I needed to of making sure that I tried to share the Lord with him. But uh, when his wife got up at the viewing last night and talked about it, there was another group of people there that I didn't know. I didn't realize that he was actually attending Bible study. His family was with some other Japanese families in the area at one of the churches. So um, I'm grateful for other people that were brave enough to talk to him um, when I wasn't. So, But uh, that's, that's the priority for this week. Um, um, I need to do some farm work this week um, and uh, get some things ready for I'm going to have a guest hunting late muzzleloader. Uh, here on my home farm to try to kill a call buck. And uh, outside of that, um, plug away at work and wait till the right weather to maybe go back up to Illinois and try to kill a deer. Yep. I'm going to be doing some consulting headed to Mississippi towards the end of the week, do a couple properties down there. And uh, I hope I can get a hunt or two in this week. So. Well, thanks for your support, everybody. One of the comments that somebody made in the question is they're turning everybody on to the podcast. We know that the growth that we're hearing from uh, seeing in all the downloads is a lot to do with that. So we appreciate your all's recommendations, your comments, your support, even when we don't like them in you and you have uh, feedback uh, trying to tell us what we need to do better. That's OK, too. We appreciate it. Yep. We want to hear from everybody. So uh, hope you all have a good week. God bless. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, by a farm real estate company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.